A lot of brands are like, you know, we don't want any more Amazon sellers. We've already got 10 of them. Um, but you could bring it to their attention. You know, what are those 10 sellers really doing for you? Are they running ads? Are they improving your listings? Are they replying to negative reviews? And you could say that you will do these kind of things if you were one of their suppliers or one of their sellers, I should say. Uh, and maybe you can work it into something. There's always opportunities out there. Welcome fellow entrepreneurs to the Entrepreneur Adventure Podcast, where we talk about Amazon wholesale and how you can use it to build an e-commerce empire, a side hustle, or anything in between. And now your host, Todd Welch. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 58. I am your host, Todd Welch, and today we are going to listen into a live Amazon wholesale mine and refine call that we did, a Q&A call. So several questions from people, members in the Amazon wholesale private mine and refine group, the group that you can get into by purchasing the Mine and Refine Masterclass. So if you're interested in finding out more about Wholesale Mine and Refine, which is finding products that are collecting dust, cleaning them up, and getting them to sell really well and getting 75 to 100% ROI, check out entrepreneuradventure.com forward slash mine, M-I-N-E. You can pick up that masterclass and also get into the private Facebook group where we all help each other find and improve these listings and get some really good selling high ROI products. And I do want to apologize for the video quality if you're watching this on YouTube. I'm not sure why Facebook recorded in such low quality, but I think you will get a lot of really good information out of this episode. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into this Q&A session. So let's go ahead and get started. We've got a question from Usama Naim. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And his question is how to pitch suppliers in order to ask for exclusive rights on their products. Um, so that is a really good, but a very in-depth question. Um, how to pitch them, it can be rather difficult, Usama, in how you want to pitch a supplier to get exclusives. There's not really any perfect answer to that because you're not just going to get an exclusive with most brands. A, a super majority, you're never going to be able to. But the minority that you can get that exclusive with so that you're the only seller of that product, usually that's going to come after building a relationship with them. Um, so you need to get them to know, like, and trust you. So that is where your salesmanship is going to come in, um, in showing them that you're the expert, that you're someone to be trusted, and that you can do what you say that you're going to do in selling their products, whether you're promising them to increase their sales or just improve their listing, which of course would increase their sales. Whatever the case may be that you're promising them, um, they need to believe you and, and understand that you can actually do that. So most of the exclusives that I have have come after I've been selling a product for a while and I've gotten to know the company. A lot of times I'm talking and maybe communicating right with one of the owners and we build that relationship. And then after I've been selling their products for a while, maybe I take it upon myself to just improve one of their listings. Um, like I talk about in the Mine and Refine uh, class, the master class, I then after improving their listing, that's when I will ask that, you know, hey, would you maybe want to enter into an exclusive agreement where I would be the only seller of your products on Amazon? And in exchange, what I did for you on this one listing, and you can see the improvements in the sales, I'll do that on all of the other listings as well. 
Uh, so that's kind of how most of my exclusives have come. Um, I've got one that I was just lucky in, in that I had contacted them. Um, they didn't want any Amazon sellers and they were also selling to Amazon directly, uh, but Amazon became a headache for them. And they reached out to me and said, hey, we don't want to do Amazon anymore. Will you just take it off of our plate? And so that one, I just got lucky with being able to get that. But um, that's one of the things that happens, right? As I like to say, you have to put yourself in a position for luck to find you. Um, if I wasn't reaching out to suppliers and doing Amazon wholesale and building this business, that luck would have never found me, right? So maybe it wasn't really luck. It was just all the work that I've been doing, um, put myself in the right position for that uh, exclusive agreement to come my way. Um, but that's not going to usually happen, right? Usually it's going to come from working hard and building a relationship with a supplier and then working that into an exclusive agreement some point down the line. Um, but you have to have you know something to offer them, whether it's increasing their sales, running advertisement, uh, redoing their listings, and things like that. And one thing for anybody listening to this on the podcast or the YouTube uh, after this has been recorded live, this is only going out to the Amazon Wholesale Mine and Refine private group is the only place where we're doing this live right now. And that group is available to anybody who's purchased the Wholesale Mine and Refine Masterclass, where I really dive into how to update a listing, listings that are collecting dust, update them and make them sell much better and get most of those sales all to yourself at a super high ROI, maybe 75 to 100% ROI uh, for a good amount of time. And maybe you can even turn that into an exclusive agreement. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, check out entrepreneurventure.com forward slash mine, M-I-N-E, and that will take you to the page where you can learn more about that masterclass. Uh, it's only $47 and you can get that over three hours of uh, education in that masterclass where I really go into in depth how I find these listings, improve them and really make good money off of selling them. All right. So Usama, hopefully that answered your question there. Uh, next one here is from Mike Krause. And his question here, if a brand sells variation and only one sells well, but we have a ton of the not so well selling variations, can we create a new listing with a bundle of say two of the items, one of the good selling with a lesser desirable with a price that still keeps us profitable? Um, this is an easy question, but hard to explain. So I hope you can understand without videos or visuals. Um, yeah, so I definitely understand. So we've got a listing, maybe they've got red, blue, green, purple, and black variations of the product. And maybe the red one sells really well and all the rest of them do not sell very well. Um, so you're saying, should we take a red one and maybe put it with a black one, make a separate listing as a bundle and sell that product and maybe we can get people to purchase that. So it's definitely not a bad idea, uh, but it kind of depends on some variables. And number one, would anyone want to buy the really good selling one with one of the other variations that are not selling well? Uh, is it a product that lends well to buying multiples of that same item? you know, would somebody want to? So that would be your first question. Um, if you're buying, let's say, oh, I don't know, a television just off the top of my head, and they've got a 32 inch, a 48 inch and a 24 inch television, most likely people are not going to want to buy two televisions, right? So that would not be a good bundle. Um, but let's say maybe it was um, some dog treats right? And they've got the blue dog treats and the green dog treats. Um, there, maybe people would want to buy both of those. Um, so you could bundle them together and sell them as, as a bundle. That may work. 
Um, so you have to figure that out first if the bundle makes sense at all, because it may make sense. It may not make sense. Um, and Mike says uh, it's big in the toy category. So yeah, toy category, um, maybe you've got a red tractor, a blue tractor, and a green tractor, and the green one sells really good. And so you want to package it with the, the blue one or something like that. Um, it's really hard to say if it would work or not. It's something that you could experiment with and see. Uh, now, one thing you want to keep in mind is if the brand is registered on Amazon, you're not going to be able to create that bundle listing under their brand name. Um, so you may have to create a bundle listing under your own brand name and put those products in uh, like a, a bag with your printed logo on them and things like that. Uh, because if the, the brand name is registered, and sometimes even if it's not registered, they may not let you create a listing using their brand. So that's probably something you'd want to do first. Try to create the listing, um, you know, not necessarily a real listing that you're going to go through with, but just start the process of creating it and see if you get an error message that says you can't even create it. Um, because that will be a whole separate ordeal uh, because you're not going to be able to take advantage of that brand name. Um, and you could also potentially get in trouble with the brand. If the brand doesn't want you to create that bundle, they could technically get that bundle taken down if you created it under their name. Um, now, if you went the whole ordeal in creating the bundle under your own brand name and you put some of the products together and created it under your brand name, you could do that and get away with that. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem for the most part. Uh, the brand still could technically have it taken down if they were really stingy about that kind of stuff. So you want to be a little bit careful with that and make sure the brand is okay with it or that the products are generic enough that most likely it's not going to matter. Um, so it's hard to say if it's going to be a good idea or not. Uh, I've created bundles in the past, and some have worked, some have not. Uh, what I've done more than creating the bundles with different colors is, let's say, we'll stick with the tractor thing. Let's say they have a green tractor and a red tractor that are on Amazon, and they're in a variation listing, and they're selling decent or selling well, um, but maybe they have a blue tractor that's not listed on Amazon. Or maybe it's listed on Amazon, but the listing is separate. It's not a part of the variation. What I like to do there is either create that listing for the blue tractor and put it under the variation or take that blue listing and move it under the variation because then I can take advantage of the traffic that is going to the green tractor and the red tractor and now maybe siphon off some of those sales to the blue tractor, which probably isn't selling well, um, but I can be one of the, maybe the only seller or the first FBA seller for that and hopefully get some of those traffic from the other tractors from the variation listing and get those sales all to myself. So that is something that I do uh, a lot more frequently than take, creating a variation bundle or creating a bundle from a variation. Um, so hopefully that makes sense, uh, Mike. Let me know if that makes sense to you in the chat there since you're with us, um, and if you have any other questions on that, and I can circle back around and answer them or clarify something a little bit more if you'd like. Next question is from Sassy Fung. Hopefully I'm saying that right. She says, hi, Todd, can you please share some experience on what is the common practice in terms of dealing with suppliers? Is it normal to ask the vendor for samples of their products if they can? Uh, well, let me take these one at a time because there's quite a few here. Um, so is it normal to ask the vendors for samples of their products? Um, I don't think it is normal. I've never asked for samples of products from a vendor. It doesn't mean they won't. 
Um, you can definitely ask, uh, but I don't think it's common practice to get samples uh, from a vendor. Um, in, pri in the private label world where you're creating your own product there, it is very common to get samples. In the wholesale world, uh, not so much. Um, you can definitely ask. There's no harm in asking. They might say yes, they might say no, uh, but I don't think it's common practice. Um, if they can offer to put the FNSKU labels on the products. Um, so the FNSKU labels, the labels from Amazon, um, that is not necessarily common practice either. Um, but if they are willing to ship directly into Amazon for you, then you can definitely ask them if they would be willing to put the labels on there. Um, I have a very few that will actually do that. Uh, most of the time, I'm just paying Amazon to put the label on the product for me. Um, so they're shipping directly from their warehouse to Amazon's warehouse, and then Amazon will charge you the 30 cents to put the labels on the product for you. Um, so if they're gonna direct ship for you, which keep in mind, that's like a 50-50 shot uh, maybe even less than 50% that will actually direct ship for you. A lot of the times you're going to have to send it to your own warehouse, maybe to your garage or to a prep center uh, to have the preparation done. There's some suppliers out there that are very strict that they will not ship to Amazon, period. Um, others will, uh, some won't. So you're going to have to find that out. Um, and then she goes on to say, or even a virtual site walk of their warehouse. So a tour of their warehouse factory. Um, that, again, I don't think is very common uh, either. Uh, I've never had anyone do that. Uh, you could definitely ask if they'd give you a tour of the factory, especially right now with COVID and everything going on. Uh, they might be more open to doing that since you can't physically go to the warehouse or the factory. Um, and then she says, just to be more assured that you are dealing with a real business and not a scammer. Um, so yeah, that definitely can be a fear, right? That you're, they're going to take your money and not send the product. Um, I've never had a problem with it. You know, most of these suppliers that I'm contacting, I find them on Google. I look at their website. I can see they're carrying legit products. Uh, I contact them on the phone. I talk to someone there. Um, if you want to, you can look them up on Google Maps, the address they, that they provide, see what the building looks like. You know, hopefully they have street view and you can go there like you're standing right out in front. Um, there is an episode that we talked about um, uh, going and actually getting a private investigator. If you're really worried about it, the private investigator for a few hundred dollars can drive to their warehouse, investigate, maybe go inside, talk with them, look at the trucks coming and going. So that's a little more of an extreme example. Um, I've never done any of that and I've never had a problem. Uh, you know, that's why we make those small orders up front, right? We're not going too crazy. Uh, we're still maybe spending hundreds, maybe up to $1,000 on those initial orders. So that can definitely be fearful. Uh, but if you do your due diligence, uh, make sure the website is legit, call them on the phone, talk to them, maybe look them up at the local Chamber of Commerce and see if they're listed in the Chamber of Commerce business directory. Uh, find them, maybe they have a Facebook group or something like that. Uh, and everything looks good there. You'll probably be okay uh, and you can move forward. And if you wanted to, you can make take those more advanced steps doing a private investigator or something like that uh, to dig deeper. Um, let me keep going on this. She's got lots of questions here. Also, how can I know the products I am buying are in good condition? Is it normal to do product inspections? Um, so again, that kind of comes down to trusting the company that you're buying from. Um, but that is something that your prep center can look at the products for you. If you're getting them yourself, you can look at them. That's one reason I recommend your first initial order. Ship it to yourself or a prep center, even if the company is willing to ship directly, because that way the prep center can look at the products or you can look at the products yourself and see if there's anything you're missing. 
make sure that they're matching up to what's selling on Amazon. So that's the reason why I do that step. Um, in terms of inspections, I've never done an inspection, but you could definitely pay someone to do an inspection if you wanted to. Um, and she goes on to say, I saw that this practice is quite common in the private label model. Don't know if it's applicable and common in the wholesale model. I'm new to selling on Amazon and I'm in the stage of contacting suppliers. Thanks a lot for any advice you can give on this. Cheers. So yes, all those things are common in private label, not so much in wholesale. Uh, you're pretty much just going to have to figure it out and hopefully it'll be okay. You can make that small order, make sure everything's good on the small order before making those bigger orders. So um, Sassy, hopefully that answers those questions there for you. Uh, Mike says, my second question, so just add my variations to the existing listing. Um, yes, that's typically what I am doing, um, adding products to an existing variation or creating a brand new variation listing. Um, and therefore, I'm taking advantage of the traffic from maybe one or two good selling products, adding all the other variations together so that I can take advantage of that traffic and maybe sell those other colors or whatever the variation may be. All right, let's see. Next one here from Mike Gilbert. Todd, I thought it was mentioned in the MNR, the Mine and Refine Masterclass, something to this effect that before even purchasing a product from a supplier, that you go ahead and make changes, improvements to the listing on Amazon. Maybe I misunderstood this. In any case, can you elaborate that? Uh, by the way, if I got that wrong, my apologies. Um, no, nope, you are definitely correct, Mike. Uh, so, if you are going to do the wholesale mine and refine where maybe a listing is getting a handful of sales a month right now, but the listing is really bad and you want to fix it up, you need to find out if you can actually fix up that product first, because if it's brand registered, you're not going to be able to make any changes. If it's not brand registered, typically you can work, you can either make the changes yourself in your own back end, or more often than not, you're going to have to work with seller support to get the changes made. So what I will do is add the product to my seller central as a merchant fulfilled, as if I'm going to ship it from my own warehouse. And I'll set the price significantly above whoever else is selling on that listing. If nobody else is selling, then I'll look at the keeper graph and set it significantly higher than whatever it was selling in previously, because I don't want to accidentally get a sale. Um, and then I will add one unit to that listing as if I have it for sale. So we're taking a little bit of a risk there that something could sell. And then we have to cancel that listing, which would negatively affect our account. Um, but the odds are extremely minimal that they're going to sell if your price is higher uh, significantly than other people who are selling on there. Um, but once you get that, have that one in stock, now you can go to the help section and request those changes through the help tool. Um, and there is step-by-step -step process that we can walk you through. And in the master class, we go through this step-by-step. -step. Um, but if you go to help, you can follow the tree there uh, to make a change to the listing and uh, see if the listing will go through. And you can start with something really simple. Uh, like trying to change maybe a bullet point or description or perhaps the title. And it might go through automatically using that tool. If it does, awesome. It might not go through with that tool. So then it'll say, okay, we have to open up a ticket with this. So it'll open up a ticket with seller support and seller support will look at it and what you're going to want to do is make sure you send them like a link to the manufacturer website, uh, pictures of the product if you can find them. And a good way to find them if you don't have the product is to look on eBay. A lot of times you can find pictures that other people have taken uh, because they want photos of the product without them being digitally edited. So like the product on a table or something like that. 
Um, you can look at Google Images and see if you can find something there as well um, and provide that to them. Maybe even the manufacturer's website might have photos. And provide them with those photos and see if they can get that change to go through. Um, if you can get the change to go through, then you're golden. You can make an order and you should be able to get the other changes that you want done as well. Um, but it might come back and say, sorry, this is brand registered. Only the brand owner can make these changes. So, excuse me, then you can know right off the bat that you're not going to be able to make changes without the permission from the brand owner. So in that case, um, you either have to give up on that product or reach out to the brand owner and explain to them what you're trying to do, what you want to do for them and see if they're willing to do that. Uh, maybe you can work it into uh, being able to sell their products and exclusive down the road, whatever the case may be. Uh, but that way, you know ahead of time uh, if you can actually make those changes or not. So that is how I explain. I go in more detail, I think, in the master class on that. Uh, but hopefully uh, that kind of helps clarify that li a little bit, Mike. If not, uh, let me know in the chat and maybe I can dig into that a little bit more before we finish up here. All right. The next question here from Stan Garber. Uh, Stan says, hi, Todd. Could you please share the signs from your experience that can tip us off ahead of time as far as how easy or hard it would be to change a listing? I have tried to change a number of listings with blatant incorrect titles or brand names, and very, very often I get a response that this listing cannot be changed or something to that effect. After I ask uh, to change a listing through opening a case with seller support. Um, so Stan, what I just went through uh, really pertains to your question as well. You kind of want to go through that process ahead of time. Uh, to determine if you can sell uh, or uh, make changes to the listing. Um, you know, if if the brand is selling a product specifically, uh, sometimes that can tip you off to the product being brand registered. Um, but really, a lot of times it's hard to say. But another thing that you can look at is if you scroll down to the description area, if there's any kind of A-plus content, um, as in, you know, the description, instead of just a block of text, it shows like pictures and a nice layout and things like that down below. That typically, or, well, that is only able to be done when a brand is registered. Um, so that would tip you off that you're not going to be able to make any changes. Um, if there's any video um, in the photo section, um, then that means that the brand is registered because you can typically only upload those videos if the brand is registered. When you click on the brand name on Amazon, uh, I'm trying to look at an example here real quick. Um, if you go to the product and you're looking at the product and the brand name just says brand colon and then the name of the brand, Typically, uh, that can be give you an idea that it's not brand registered. It's not foolproof, but usually when a brand registers their brand, they will create a brand store. So what it will say then once they've created a brand store is instead of brand colon and then the brand name, it'll say visit brands store instead. Um, and so therefore, you'll know that it's brand registered also, and you're not going to be able to make any changes. Um, other than that, there's not really any easy way to know if it's registered or if you're going to be able to make changes other than to what I just talked about, creating that merchant filled item and trying to make the changes. Um, one thing I forgot to mention that after you get those changes done or find out that you can't make the changes, make sure you delete that uh, manufacturer merchant fulfilled item or at least change it to zero quantity so you don't accidentally uh, get a sale there. We don't uh, accidentally want to make a sale that we can't fulfill, then have to cancel it. And Amazon doesn't like that too much. All right, Stan, so hopefully that answered that question for you. And that are, is all the questions that we had ahead of time. So let's go ahead and see if we have any new ones here in the live chat. 
Um, let's see. We've got Danielle Johansson. He says, I often see some sellers have the information in their seller profile that they are the official appointed brand seller of XXXX products. Would you stay away from such products? I shipped in 25 units and sold out and nothing happened, thinking to ship in more. Um, so I have seen that before. It's hard to say how legit it is. It's probably legit, but anybody, you can type anything in the description of your store. Um, so just because they put it there doesn't necessarily mean anything. And I also don't take a lot of weight to, if I get a message from someone who says, you know, we're the exclusive seller of this, please remove yourself. Because number one, it's against terms of service for another seller to message you that kind of information. Um, and number two, anybody can say that. Um, so you got to take that with a grain of salt, unless it's the actual brand uh, messaging you, you know, the brand and the same brand name as the seller. And you look at their seller account, it has the same address as the brand. Um, then you can take it a little bit more seriously. Um, but otherwise, you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. Um, and, you know, if you want to be careful, I, you can call the brand and just say, hey, do you have an exclusive seller for this product on Amazon? Because this person is claiming that they are. Uh, maybe they don't even know that that is going on and you're bringing it to their attention um, and you will be looked upon favorably for bringing that to their attention. Or maybe they'll say, yeah, uh, we have an exclusive with them. We don't want anybody else selling. Um, now, you sent in 25 units, which is fine. They sold, nothing happened, which is good. Uh, you could send in more units. Maybe nothing will happen. Or maybe next time you'll get an IP complaint and Amazon will take down your listing and you're going to have to provide invoices to Amazon to prove that you have legitimate products that you are selling. Um, if you bought from a legitimate distributor or direct from the brand, you shouldn't have any problem getting that IP complaint removed. Um, so then it's up to you as to if you want to keep selling that product because legally uh, it's a gray area as to whether a brand uh, can stop someone from selling on Amazon. There's no real legal precedence. What they try to say is that if you are not buying with permission from the brand, then the brand's warranty is not in effect. And therefore, the product you are selling is not authentic. I don't know of a court case that has gone all the way through and proven that one way or another, but that is what legal companies like Voris, which is a really popular one that brands like to send uh, legal letters through, uh, that's what they try to claim a lot of times. Um, so typically, I usually just sell through the products and I don't uh, sell a product anymore. Uh, occasionally, I'll keep selling if it's a really good selling product, uh, uh, unless I get one of those legal letters. Uh, at that point, it's not worth my time. I'm not going to go into a legal battle for selling a product when there's so many other products out there that I can find and start selling. Um, you could potentially reach out to the brand, though, and talk to them about it. Uh, maybe if you get in their good graces, they'll let you be one of the exclusive sellers or one of the few sellers that they have on a brand. Uh, a lot of brands are like, you know, we don't want any more Amazon sellers. We've already got 10 of them. Um, but you could bring it to their attention. You know, what are those 10 sellers really doing for you? Are they running ads? Are they improving your listings? Are they replying to negative reviews? Um, and, you know, you can look on the listing and tell these things if people are actually doing it. And you can say that you will do these kind of things if you were one of their suppliers or one of their sellers, I should say. Uh, and maybe you can work it into something. There's always opportunities out there. Uh, but you have to decide, you know, how much risk you want to take in terms of continuing to sell a product uh, that uh, maybe you shouldn't be selling or the brand doesn't want you to sell. Um, Dan Daniel says, thank you. I am buying from a distributor who is buying direct from the manufacturer. Um, so, yeah, most of the IP complaints I get are that route, uh, buying from a distributor uh, and then the brand sees you and they don't know where you got the product and they don't want you selling it. Um, so you should have no problem getting any IP complaints removed if the distributor is legit. Um, and then you just have to decide where you want to go from there. 
Uh, let's see. So we have a question from, I am probably going to butcher your first name. Ahad, Ad, Ahad, Ab, Ab. So sorry, I'm sure I'm butchering it. Um, but he says, I have the pack size on a listing changed where I am one of the three FBA sellers. I have tried to get the pack size changed back to the original in Seller Central, but it does not get updated on the listing. Opening a case with seller support, and they replied that the listing was controlled by the brand, and they are unable to make any changes. Is there any way to get the pack size updated back to the original? Um, so I think what you mean there is that the pack size must be wrong on Amazon. Maybe it's a three pack and it says a one pack or something like that. Um, if it's brand registered, there's not really anything you can do about it. Amazon is is just not going to do anything, uh, especially the first level of support. They're not going to dig deep enough to understand what you're trying to tell them. Um, maybe if you got to the second level, uh, but odds are if it's brand registered, they're not going to do anything without the brand uh, approving those changes or making them changes the, themselves. So really the only thing you can do there is reach out to the brand, bring it to their attention that this is wrong and that it should be updated. And it's really up to them if they update it or not. Uh, some brands will, most probably will not, unfortunately. So you're just going to have to kind of deal with that problem. Um, if it's an issue where it's deceiving to the customer, you could potentially ask that to be escalated to like captive support uh, or brand registry support and see if they're willing to make that change. Um, but from my experience, the odds are pretty low that you're going to get someone to understand enough what you want to do and to care about what you want to do that they'll actually do it. Most of the time, they're just going to reply, the script reply and say, Sorry, this is a brand registered. We, we can't make any changes, but we sent your request over to the brand. Um, and that's really all you're going to get for the most part. All right. So any other questions from the live audience here before we wrap up? Uh, if you have anything, go ahead and post that in the chat. Um, and again, uh, if you guys out there are interested in the Amazon Wholesale Mining Refine Masterclass that I put together, a three-hour in-depth training on how I find products that are collecting dust on Amazon. Maybe they're getting five or 10 sales. I clean up those listings, make them nice and shiny, boost those sales to maybe 50 or 100 or more get those sales all to myself. And that ROI can really be awesome. A lot of times it's 75, 100%, sometimes even higher than that. And you'll get those listings all to yourself for quite a long time. You can maybe turn that into an exclusive agreement from that brand. Uh, head on over to entrepreneuradventure.com forward slash mine, M-I-N-E. And once you purchase that masterclass, $47, you'll get access to the private Facebook group that we're in right now where we try to help each other and answer questions uh, for anyone trying to do the same, uh, doing the wholesale mine and refine. So definitely check that out, entrepreneuradventure.com forward slash mine. Um, and let's see, Mike says, thanks for the time. Uh, Leticia says, this was awesome. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate you joining me, Leticia, and everybody else out there that joined me live and anybody listening to this on the podcast in YouTube. Really appreciate you being a part of my entrepreneur adventure and letting me help you guys out there grow your business. Uh, so yeah, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. My name's Todd Welch with Entrepreneur Adventure, signing off. Happy selling, everybody. This has been another episode of the Entrepreneur Adventure Podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow entrepreneur. And always remember, success is yours if you take it.